<laughs> started off. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, welcome. Um, can I just run through some housekeeping matters first of all before we start the meeting? Um, if you're moving about in the chamber, I'd appreciate you wearing a mask, but when we're seated, we don't need to, given the numbers that are here this evening. Um, next item is there's no fire alarm planned tonight, so if there's one, start running and you know where the doors are. Um, the meeting is being recorded and, in fact, it It is also, um, this, we are, at, if you could use your microphone to speak, because it's also been recorded through the microphone system. So that, that's the housekeeping, and we'll get into the meeting proper. Uh, welcome, everybody. We have apologies from Jeff Dale, I believe. Thank you. We received those earlier. Thank you. Any declarations of interest in any items on the agenda? No, thank you. No declarations of interest. Minutes of the previous meeting, they've pre previously been uh, circulated. Is everyone happy they are a true record of that meeting? And everyone's happy. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you. Uh, petitions, deputations, and questions. None received, Chair. Thank you. Questions from members. None received, Chair. Thank you. Um, notices and motions. None received, Chair. Thank you. Item seven Future Ways of Working, a report from Strategic Director of Resources. Um, it's from um, Oliver or Carol, I'm, I'm sorry, Councillor <laughs> Council Hemsley or Mrs. Snell. It's Miss Snell, yes, thank Ms. you, Snell, <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, good evening, members. Um, this is a follow up report to um, based on previous reports that we've had here at this uh, committee regarding where we're at with our ways of working. Um, we commenced the trial of a hybrid model in October last year. Just as, as a reminder, a hybrid model describes a situation where an employee works part of their time at home and part in the office um, as defined by the needs of the service. Therefore, some roles are not able to uh, you know, work in a hybrid manner because they either work predominantly within the community, such as a community support worker, or they're site-based, so for example, our premises um, officers. Uh, unfortunately, in December, we then saw Plan B measures come into play and guidance to work from home wherever possible was reintroduced. So we did step back from our hybrid uh, model and way of working. We had, though, at that point, started to see a little bit of an increase in people coming into the office to establish a hybrid way of working. Um, fairly small numbers, I would say, early on, as you can see in the paper. Um, but clearly that fell again in December when the working from home guidance was reintroduced. So our opportunity to really trial the hybrid model was actually much more reduced than what we had anticipated. And we had already said that it was our intention to conduct a review around January, February time. Um, however, prior to plan B, at the end of November, we had actually already undertaken a pulse survey with staff to check in how we felt and how they felt the trial was going just two months in. So whilst that was quite early on, it did identify some interesting trends and it did give a good insight, although at a very early stage, into how staff had been feeling, perhaps over a longer period of time, in terms of their working arrangements. I think in particular, it did tell us that the balance of the hybrid model at that stage did remain much more predominantly biased on working at home rather than coming into um, the office. Uh, although, as I said, there was a small increase in terms of people coming back in. Uh, we asked staff a range of questions, and one of the interesting uh, questions was, about, well, what influences your behaviour and your choices? Why do you come into the building? Um, to work and, and equally why do you stay at home most of the time to work and, and the summary of the feedback is given in um, paragraph um, three. I think it, we saw from I think the survey which was very well responded to that, that staff have adapted quite considerably over the last almost two years now and the support measures that we've put in place um, has meant that working from home um, has, has for people uh, and their way of working been quite productive um, and, and worked very well for them and for uh, the service and certainly has been quite, quite welcomed um, by staff. I think for, from last time's meeting, members were clear they did want to hear about some of the disadvantages and the not so good things about um, a hybrid or home working um, arrangements. And, you know, clearly there are some staff who, who don't like it, you know, some do and work with it very well, some do not like it. Some have come back into the building and have done um, for a while and some actually feel everybody else should too, to be fair. 
Um, now, whilst those numbers are, are in, in the minority, that they are relatively small numbers, as you'll see from, from the headline survey response, we have made it very clear to all staff that it's equally important that those that might feel they are in the minority do have a voice and do speak up and are able to articulate their views and opinions about their own ways of working and that of their, their colleagues and what they perceive be uh, the case across the organisation. Uh, and at SMT, our senior management team and our extended leadership team, we've also been reflecting on the model from an organisational point of view. I think we've been very clear that, um, and I talked about, you know, the choices and the behaviour that individuals um, make, but equally, you know, or just as importantly, or if not more so, you know, organisationally, how we operate and how effective we are, um, you know, is, is, a, is a prime consideration. Um, and we've been talking around, um, you know, our ability to operate as an organisation, the challenges we have um, coming ahead, you know, very difficult few years ahead in terms of managing budget pressures. We have a new corporate plan we're working to, we're, we're establishing priorities and commitments. We've been working on new set of values. You know, there's lots of things organisationally that we are looking to develop and, and grow. And I'm sure you've heard Mark talk a lot about those things um, as well. So I think we have still got quite an iterative process to go through. Um, we haven't set our model in tablets of stone. We are still not saying that this is the definitive um, model. But I think there is a very clear message that going back to how it was pre-pandemic, um, I think organisationally it's felt not less to be the most healthiest thing to do. It wasn't perfect what we had before. Uh, I think the ways of working um, have evolved considerably. And you know, if we look across, you know, not just the region, you know, and even, even globally, flexible ways of working, you know, is, is pretty much here to stay. Um, but I think, you know, for us, there are still things we acknowledge that we still need to, to develop and learn. And as I said, we've been having dialogues at senior management team, extended leadership team, staff forums. Mark and I are currently doing some small group manager discussion sessions, and this inevitably is a feature of that. But we're talking more broadly about our leadership and management and ability to, to deliver um, within the organisation. Um, so I think there's, there's lots of strands that are coming together in terms of um, organisationally how we need to grow, grow and develop. Um, so we're currently still working through the initial framework that we um, developed. Um, some of the feedback from managers is there's some aspects they do want greater clarity and message on. Um, some would like us to be very prescriptive um, and descriptive about uh, what staff should or shouldn't do. Um, other managers are um, much more comfortable working within a framework that enables them to determine for their services and their team what working model works best um, for them. Um, I think, you know, th th we can't ignore, you know, the bricks and mortar of this, of this building. Um, you know, it plays an important part because it is still the place where people do come together, no matter how, how infrequent that might be. And I think, you know, we acknowledge that this building, the, the, the size of it is not conducive to a flexible working um, model. So I think the outcome of the asset review will, will, I think, give us some intelligence and some indications as well about our way of working and, and how we can construct um, an environment and a working environment where people can come together and still it feel like a very nice beating heart of the organisation. I think currently when you come in, you're here with, you know, probably, you know, 50 other people um, in different parts of the building. And it, it's it's not about coming together with colleagues, which is what, in a way, we need to try and replicate in some way, um, other than just doing it via team. So I think a number of things still come together. I think it's still very much work in progress for us. That's not dissimilar to other organisations that we talk to. Um, uh, but I think, you know, we're fairly comfortable in terms of our journey and what we're, what we're looking to, to develop without having you know, something too concrete that we can't then shift on. I think one of the advantages of having sort of the flexible model that we were in, we were able to readjust back to plan B fairly quickly. You know, we didn't have to revert and, and push people back out of the building too much. We could adjust and move to that um, fairly easily. Um, but yeah, happy to take any other comments and observations. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any comments, observations, views on the paper presented? Councillor Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of specific questions and then a general point. Um, and I may have missed this. Ha what percentage of employees are in this hybrid model group? Because obviously that's my, that's my first question. My second question 
is, as I understand it, then we're not talking about any changes to any contracts at the moment. So all, all roles, if they're office based, will be continued to be defined as office based. And then I have a general, perhaps those two questions first. Thank you. Well, uh, yeah, thank you, Councillor Powell. Can I answer the second one first? <laughs> um, no, there's not any current changes to terms and conditions of employment. Um, our contracts, um, in terms of location, remains as is. So um, that would mean that if we were to require people to come into the building, then contractually we can do so because their contract has not not changed and in fact it, it's unlikely we would need to change them drastically because of um, the clauses within our contract and how we talk about working location um, and we also have a flexible working policy which actually covers quite broadly the flexibility in the ways that we're working so I think in terms of that framework of employment your employment contract we're, we're in you know very good good position without having to drastically do a huge piece of work under t's and c's at this point in time uh, the first bit about how many are in the hybrid model that's quite a difficult number to, to quantify because we haven't said to any employee you don't you know you're not in this hybrid model but naturally because of their service and their ways of working as i said before it, it would by default preclude some of that but i think we're cautious and we've been very minded not to put people into categories i know some organizations have identified sort of a category of employee and, and ident you know, identified them that and given them that label we've been cautious not to do that because I think it really very markedly defines you know you're a certain type of worker and I'm not so in essence everybody is in that framework but practically that is not the case um, but in terms of how many numbers I mean we've got probably 50, probably about 100 or so but that is pretty much a guesstimate that I would say are in roles that are more predominantly community based or premises based, maybe slightly less than that. Thank you. Yeah, it was just that that overview really of how many employees that affected. Um, just on a general point, and I think this is all fine. Obviously, there's a lot of work developing it. I think one of my concerns is is drift, and I can understand you want to constantly review it but I'm just wondering have you got any sort of defined points at which and I and accept that you know there will be a model and then it might have to change but as I'm seeing other companies are doing that but have a you know you've been and I know things have changed but since October you've been testing and that to me seems quite a long time I was wondering if there's if you've got any sort of milestones for the next stage Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, we did have some milestones um, set. So our review was January, February, with a, a view then to having a, a perhaps a more defined policy for, for April. Um, now that is potentially still doable, but because plan B measures disrupted the hybrid model slightly, as I said before, we only really had a couple of months where we were really trialing it. So we are starting to see, since Plan B measures ended again, a slight increase in people adopting more of a bit of a return back into the building, but it's, it's fairly slow. Um, I would say from the discussions we've been having, uh, the leadership team and with all uh, staff groups, I think we can redefine the model. So you know, my, my objective would still be to go out with a more defined model for April. But as you said, with some caveats that, you know, we need some flexibility to adjust to that, depending on organisational change or need, or indeed whatever happens with the pandemic. So I think it's having that flexibility to adapt and adjust, depending on what might else come upstream. But yeah, certainly trialling for April was, was our original timeline, yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a, a couple of questions uh, also and some general comments. Um, my question, well, my main question actually, is um, to do with sorry, uh, the impact on newish starters. Because um, later on, when we, we look at the paper on um, um, retention, 
um, it does say that the stuff well the data suggests that those that have been with us for the sh a short period are more likely to be leaving um, nine percent have got less than a year service and yet 27 percent of uh, sorry, have left it in the last year compared with 9% the year before. And really, it, it, it's around that. And do we think that people being predominantly at home is negatively impacting on new starters? That's really what's behind my question. Or have we not yet done any work on that? Because um, that's actually important consideration. Yeah, I would agree, and I, I, I can honestly say I don't have any definitive evidence to to say that was the case. I think we we can see, and as we've said in the retention paper, that there has been a higher turnover of people within their first year, which we need to dive into a little bit more. But the analysis that we did at that point wasn't indicating that it was because of our ways of working that led to um, led to them going. I think the issue for me is whether for those starters and people coming in that certainly joined us since March 20 and that haven't um, worked in this building with the rest of the staff in the way that we did. In fact, Tom and I were having a discussion about it um, earlier on. Whether that means your you know, your, your induction and your incorporation into the organisation because of the way that you're working, whether that does have a direct correlation on turnover, um, either here or anywhere. I think it's, it's an interesting study Thank um, you. and something we certainly need to look at when recruitment and retention yeah. is difficult enough as it Thank is. Thank you. Yeah. And that is really what I'm getting at. And it's not the quality or otherwise of the managers in the induction. It's just that in reality, induction into a job um, can carry on for a year or two um, and it's happening because you know you're you're making contact with people perhaps not your immediate work colleagues but others because you know it evolves and a lot of that happens because you bump into people but you're not getting that if you're new to an organization so that was what lay behind that question but my general comment notwithstanding the inadequacy of this building which i think we all recognize from a workplace point of view i think i welcome councillor powers question your answer to it um, i think we have to be very clear that people are office-based or wherever uh, if we don't we as employers are opening ourselves up to a, a lot of uh, potential difficulties and challenges around insurance, health and safety and all those sorts of things. Because once we say to people you are home based, we become responsible for their home office. And so I think we need to be very conscious of that. Um, and also we become responsible uh, for their mental health as well, in a way that we're not if um, if we've got them in the building, as it were, because uh, if somebody's in the building and they're struggling, then somebody's going to notice. If you're struggling at home, nobody's going to notice necessarily. So I think we need to um, make the emphasis more on the business and less on what people want. And I was quite concerned to see uh, a reference, and I can't find it right now, in the papers to people choosing to work at home. Well, I don't think people should choose. I think it should be a permissive. And I'm, I'm not against people working from home if, if it works for their manager and their manager's manager. But I don't think it should be the individual's choice, which is a bit how it's coming across. Um, so that's what I wanted to say in general terms. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, okay. Yes, acknowledged. Thank you. Yeah. And so ju just to clarify in terms of the contracts and the home, uh, clearly if people were 100% at home, that is a different type of contract and would reflect the issues that you've just raised because there are things that we do would still need to manage in terms of potential risk, but we don't have anybody in that category. We haven't moved to providing 100% home working contracts for anybody at this point in time. Yeah. Sorry, I'd like to come back on that, please. Um, 
I know we don't have people on 100% home working contracts, but if somebody is 100% working at home, then by default, we have accepted it. And I think that potentially, as an employer, puts us in a, a vulnerable position. Uh, so I think we need to be making it clear that um, whilst you may, with your manager's agreement, work the most of your time at home actually when we say you come in you come in and we ensure that people come in on a, a regular not necessarily frequent but a regular basis yeah and that is referenced in our current framework and i acknowledge the point and again perhaps one of those areas we just need to make sure it's 110 percent clear yeah that's fine. thank you thank you Councillor Bull. yes uh, thank you chairman uh, well first of all i i would echo the the comments and the words of my fellow councillors here. Um, it's undoubtedly that the pandemic, uh, COVID, has created an opportunity for change. And that possible change has some advantages. I think there are also uh, some negatives. Um, and I have a cautious approach going forward to this. I think they are, there are many implications and why I'm urging caution is that some of those implications are not yet fully understood. You only have to read some of the financial papers and look to the City of London as to how they're looking at their business and how change may come about. So um, I'm not going to go into the fine detail but we, we just have to be very measured in going forward. And I think uh, Councillor Waller is quite right with understanding the contracts, the implications of people working at home, the loss of the opportunity, a different form of team building, which you will certainly have uh, using the internet, as opposed to, can I go around and ask my colleagues some instant advice because I have a pressing problem, but unfortunately that person is on another internet call somewhere. I mean, there are lots of implications. Some are positive undoubtedly, um, and I think there are some negatives that we don't understand. And certainly, of course, if this were to go ahead forward, then there is a whole new financial implications for this council as opposed to our cost base, but that's for another day. Thank you. Um, Harvey, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm afraid I have to disagree slightly with my colleague, um, just um, on the, the flexible working aspects and the um, making them come in. I think um, the world has changed radically in the last two years. I think younger people certainly have embraced um, working from home and embraced technology. Um, we're moving into the time when, um, yeah, as younger people come through, they are so more used to technology than we ever were. Um, and one thing I do think, um, it is a buyer's market out there. And I think that um, we will begin struggling to recruit people if we aren't offering flexible working. I know currently in the market, a lot of younger people and a lot of professionals are looking to flexible working. And actually, I know people that have refused to apply for jobs that have um, are mandatory going into offices. I think the time of being nine to five in the office for a lot of people um, has gone. And I think we need to em embrace that. I agree with the issues around health and safety and that sort of thing. So we need policies around that. But I do think um, I will also draw the attention to the fact that the council did pass the climate change motion and actually getting people to drive in to an office just to sit in an office, um, I would hesitate and say that goes against um, a climate motion. For sure, people need to come in and touch base and that, that is quite correct. However, the mandatory working from an office place, um, I, I think has gone, those days have gone. Thank you. Do you want to respond to that? No. Ask me, do you want to respond to that? Anyway. 
Um, no, no, that's fine. I think yeah, yeah, very helpful um, comments. And I think just to perhaps uh, touching on from that and something um, Councillor Ball was saying about um, how people interact and work together. I mean, in the session we were with managers today, they were talking about um, how our relationships and partnership working with um, other organisations in the region and actually nationally is actually much broader and widened. So, and we are reaping the benefits from that in terms of um, gaining information and, and uh, joint working and you know bouncing ideas and, and contributions from elsewhere. In addition to being able to give our voice over and sharing some of the messages um, as well. And a number of people say that that is that is greater. It's better than it was before. They are involved in forum that they wouldn't have had the opportunity to before because they'd probably all have been in London, so they would have been, you know, taking hours to get down to London on a train, sitting in a meeting for several hours a day out of their time. That can be done in an hour or two, sitting either in this building or sitting at, at home. So I think, I think you're right. You know, the way of working and of being is is phenomenally different. Um, I think actually the pace is much quicker, which is a bit of a disadvantage, to be honest. I think the expectation of how we had to mobilise and change because of the pandemic hasn't eased in many respects. I think for me that is a bit of the negative. I think in terms of expectations is 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 just continually to um, to drive, and I think it's because people have been able to. Um, uh, mobilise very quickly from wherever they've needed to be in a way that we've not done before. Um, and certainly we are, we are certainly seeing this impact in terms of recruitment, there is no doubt about that. Yeah. Please. Thank you, Chairman. I really just agree with Councillor Harvey on some of this stuff. I've been looking at various job applications on, on a wide range of skills and talking with fellow people. And it does seem that home working or virtual working is very much the sort of the way we are going to be going forwards. I do have concerns about the sort of face-to-face -face team building bit. And I think it's trying to find that balance. And I think we need to be careful not to be too prescriptive on any of these things and allow that each team to develop its own skills under a framework that is set. Um, and I think, you know, obviously we need to consider those things like the climate emergency and all those things that can impact on. Um, and obviously, you know, I did mention in, in council before the uh, Rural Services Network actually having a massive increase in attendance purely because they've gone virtual and a saving. So there's some financial impacts that can go both ways in this. Uh, so I think we have opportunities, but we need to make sure we manage them safely. Thank you. Councillor Waller. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I accept I'm getting a bit long in the tooth now, and I absolutely loathe IT, but I've loathed IT since I first had to use it, which must have been goodness knows how many decades ago. And whilst the platforms that we now use for video conferencing didn't exist prior to my retirement, uh, that didn't mean we didn't video conference, we did. It was much clunkier systems, but we did do it. And I did it because I was a home-based worker for 10 years. Uh, so I am well aware of how the advantages of it, the advantages for the organization, uh, because you need less office space when people are hot desking, um, and the advantages to the individual. You know, I can do my domestic duties. I put the washing on that takes about 10 seconds um, when I'm getting up and having a stretch from my screen. But I am very conscious that my employer spent a heck of a lot of money on me and my colleagues to work from home, putting phone lines in for us, um, getting us the right IT equipment, getting us the right desks and chairs and all the rest of it. So it's not a cost neutral exercise. And I would also like to remind everybody, I don't think we need reminding, that we do actually have a flexible working policy. And that's good, but the, we're not here to make employees happy. We are here to serve the people of Rutland in the best way that we can. And we need to make sure that we retain our high levels of efficiency in that, whilst at the same time ensuring that our staff are um, comfortable as well as productive. Uh, so I, I think there's you know, a lot to be said on both sides. Thank you. Um, as, uh, as everyone else has had their opportunity, just a couple of points I'd like to comment on. Um, in paragraph 6.2, 
I think I'm, I think I may discuss this at the last meeting, and it's an area that gives me some cause for concern, and that's to do with performance measurement. Um, and I don't see anything in here that indicates that uh, we're measuring, um, particularly the outputs of individuals, that means that we can clearly understand whether we're getting the output that we experienced previously or will have in the future, some sort of base of information. Um, it's very much about the individual's performance and personal development goals, rather than about the output of the individual into the, uh, the council's requirements. So I think there's an area there that worries me. If you don't measure it, uh, you can't manage it. And I'm sure Councillor Bull have had that many times in business. It's something that uh, is drummed into us all the time. Um, so that's a comment. And I think it's an area that I will certainly continue to uh, question uh, in the future. I think the other point on 6.4 um, is the soft skills required to manage this. I think there's a, there's a real challenge for managers in managing a flexible workforce, um, and particularly for um, old individuals like myself and others, um, or the older members of the team who are used to uh, you know, being present. I think that's a challenge for them. I, I'm, obviously, I'm sure you've got that in mind in, in respect of that. Uh, uh, and I think that also comes back to the, the management of performance. Um, I think in, in summing up the issues that have been raised by colleagues, uh, I think the issues that we see are, this has to be permissive. It's not, I think that was a comment generally made around that we're not seeing you know, uh, mandatory on either front. It's a permissive situation and that's very much based on our existing policy. Um, that it's not 100% home working there will always be a requirement to come into um, a building, whatever that might be, um, to meet and greet and to discuss and do the other things, because there's nothing at the end of the day better than you know, meeting people and talking to individuals, as we well know. Um, so I think that's the point that's come out of today as well. Um, we've got the issue of what is flex, um, what is 100%, and where do we sit in that picture? And I think that's a question which I think you're still working on to come up with uh, uh, by April. And then the final one, and, and probably the, the elephant in the room in some respects, is this building and the implications for this building moving forward. What does it mean to us as an organisation? Um, you know, can we turn this into the new swimming pool? <laughs> um, and Jim, for the staff that come in. <laughs> There's an incentive for them. Uh, free gym membership, and, and you still pay for your car parking. Just a thought. Um, but then there's one final point that I'd just like to pull out, and that is at this point in time, we've got the concerns of those individuals who uh, are paying for the parking, etc. But maybe this time next year, there'll be concerns from those working from home whose um, heating costs have uh, more than doubled. And we'll be saying, oh, I can't afford to work from home and put the heating on. I have to come into the office. I just I think it's something we should monitor moving into next year. Um, that's something important. Well, oh, I've, I've stood up something here. I wish I hadn't spoken there. Yes, if, if you allow me to come back, there's one point I, I wanted to uh, mention and say we have to be cautious going forward. And that is the papers issued by the government only this week on taxation and taxation allowances. And there's a bit of a loophole in working from home. Uh, and Councillor Brown raises absolutely the point uh, on heating cost. I think the, what we, I come from a background where um, in my early days of working, this chair would have been perfectly acceptable as part of my desk and chair in my office. It is no longer acceptable today, as you know, because you have to have the furniture and the chairs that are right for your back, for your movement, whatever. And that also, if you remember with uh, computers, there's the papers that say you should get up and walk away from your machine. I think one of the major problems we have with working from home, and I'm, I'm not saying I'm against it because because we've got to be flexible, they've got to be changed. But how are we going to measure that the conditions that an individual has in their particular home is conducive to good physical health and 
Council wanted mentioned men, uh, mental, because if you're not careful, if we don't do this right, I could see down the tracks claims for I have a works accident or I have a condition. I mean, I'm not trying to put a damper on this, but I think when I said there are lots of implications and those that we do not understand, and that's just my caution. So I think we really have to go forward in stepping up, you know, our survey going forward. And I, we're not going to be alone in that. The whole of UK industry is going to be facing that, and there may well be some very good advice coming down the tracks, but we need to think a little more than what we have, I think. And that's not a criticism of the paper because it's new and it's got to be developed, but there are lots of avenues we've not yet explored. And, and this is why I'm saying at the beginning, there are pluses and there are also negatives, and we really do need to understand the whole package. Thank you, Chairman. Oh. Has Harvey indicated interest? I, I was, and um, uh, Councillor Ball did touch on that. I was um, just going to um, check that we had advised our employees over the tax break from working um, at home. I think it's worth £280 a year, um, and so it would be useful for us to, to uh, communicate that to I know they're they're looking, but currently people can claim it. So um, why not? Is my is my suggestion on that? Um, but I and I don't know whether Councillor Hemsley was going to come in. I, it was my understanding from a previous paper, and maybe I I dreamt it that we had um, that health and safety assessments had been done for our people working from home already. Um, I just want to clarify that because I think that was that had already been done. But I, yeah. Uh, yes, they have done. Yeah, we've done we've done them twice so far. Um, they're a requirement for new starters um, as well, um, and we've we've run them twice over the last um, last eighteen months. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, unless there's anything urgent, anybody else wants to pick up, we can move on to the next item. Um, thank you, Ms. Nell, for that uh, very useful discussion. Uh, next item is the uh, grievance policy, if I'm not mistaken, and this is for the committee to approve the updated grievance policy. Ms. Nell, can you pick up the uh, introduction to this? Thanks. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, obviously, we are think, very aware from time to time, you know, employees do have problems um, at work. Um, they're generally individual issues. They might feel aggrieved about um, how they perhaps have been treated. Uh, they might be annoyed by their manager or something that's happened, or they may be frustrated or disagreeing with a decision perhaps the organisation um, has made. They can be quite quite varied, as we know from our experience in, in working in a variety of organisations. Um, you know, we have a duty of care to our employees. It's something we've just been focusing on. Um, and our culture and values also mean that we, we, we want to enable and, and have a, a, a culture and environment where people do have a voice and they do speak up if there is something that they do feel um, aggrieved about. So a grievance policy gives us that framework um, in a very transparent and open way. Um, but I would also just reinforce that it's always our intention to resolve issues that arise locally and early before relying on a more formal um, course of action. Um, so we've taken the opportunity to consider some amendments to our existing policy based on our experience of, of cases over the last few years and a further health check against the ACAS code of practice. So th there's no substantial changes um, to the policy. The paper outlines the areas that we are looking to make some amendment to. Um, it's focusing uh, more clearly on ensuring that our approach and practice when we do and are faced with a grievance can be taken through a process um, as effectively and promptly um, as possible. So for example, providing clarity around some of the descriptions of what might enable um, a grievance to go forward. We certainly had a couple of cases where um, the lack of clarity around a description has perhaps hindered our ability to, to deal with um, a grievance or has opened up an issue to a grievance when perhaps it could or should have been dealt with in, in another um, way. So we're seeking to address that. Um, what we, we don't want, you know, the grievances are something where if you leave it too open to interpretation, you may actually encourage just a, you know, a, a complete uh, groundswell of staff to make issues formal, which otherwise we could and should be able to deal with through local discussion. 
um, the nature of formal grievances tend to move into an atmosphere of conflict and potential harm to, to working relationships. So our ability to deal with things around a table, have an open discussion is more able to um, encourage that relationship to be maintained. Um, so I think open, frank discussions before tempers get a little bit um, raised are a much more effective way of dealing with issues. Um, so paragraph 2.3 outlines the proposed changes, which, as I said, is primarily around clarity um, and guidance. We've shared the policy with the trade unions and they are happy to proceed um, on this basis. And we will also follow this up with some manager briefing so that they're aware of how the it's always a good reminder of, of how the policy and procedure operates. Um, let's say happy to take any further questions. Okay, any questions, comments? Go to Walla. Thank you very much, Mrs. Snell. I have a question. Um, if you are unhappy with your line manager, it might be a lot of small things that they've done that are cumulative for you. Um, and you might be um, less than robust as an individual, if I can put it that way, and therefore be unwilling to raise any of them at any point with said line manager. But put all together, we might recognize it as a legitimate grievance, whether or not it's found in your favor or not, it's neither here nor there. Um, how does, and, a member of staff who who's, fills themselves in that position, how do they use this process or indeed any other process? Or do they simply leave the organisation because they're unhappy? Um, no, they, there is facility within the policy and the procedure so that if it is, it is actually your line manager that you have the issue with, that you raise it with another line manager or that you can come to HR. Um, so I'm not sure what paragraph it's contained in, but it's 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 referenced in there about you talk to somebody I, I did I yeah. did notice that is it uh, made clear enough to staff that's my first question and the second is when you look at appendix two the grievance form it does very much lead you if you're if it's not something you deal with all the time lead you to thinking it's got to be one major incident um, I wouldn't say from experience that that has necessarily okay. been, been the case. Yeah, no, I, I wouldn't say from experience that it has to be one incident. Um, and in fact, you know, thinking about experience of cases, it, it's more aligned to what you've just said. Somebody perhaps acknowledges after a period of time, actually, do you know what? I've experienced A, B and C, X, Y and Z. And it does start to create a little bit of a cumulative effect, um, perhaps prior to somebody taking action. It's... Um, yeah, it tends to be that cumulative effect. And so they will either speak up to their manager directly. If they don't feel comfortable in doing that, they are able to speak to another manager or to, or to come to HR. Thank you. Uh, uh, just a clarification, I think on big page 32, on summary of complaint, it actually talks about particularly dates, plural, times, plural, locations, plural, and identities of those involved. So it, it does talk about potential multiple activities that uh, can be brought forward. So I think that clarifies that point. Um, I saw Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just one thing, and um, I don't know whether it fits in here or not, but I was looking at 9.7, which obviously the um, harassment and um, bullying claims and the grievance procedure and policy covers that. Um, now, the only thing that I hadn't seen written anywhere in here was around confidentiality. So... Um, and I didn't know whether the grievance policy is covered under confidentiality per se or not, because it's not kind of clear there whether your line manager can go and tell anyone at the coffee machine per se. It's, it's not written in there. Now, it could be that I'm just being a bit silly, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And then when I saw certainly around harassment and bullying, if we're covering harassment and bullying, somebody might be quite reticent to come forward in those circumstances if they felt per se that the policy and they weren't covered by some elements of confidentiality within the um, investigative period, I suggest. Yeah, thank you. I'll have another read through and ensure that that is effectively covered. I mean, there is a reference on the checklist, all documents to remain confidential, but I think you're right about just ensuring that through a process, 
there retains an element of confidentiality on both parties. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, can I just a couple, couple of quick points? Um, I'm sorry to pick up on this, uh, but on um, 5.7, um, um, we talk about uh, taking notes and the, it doesn't, the manager should get somebody to take notes. But in fact, on 8.6, we talk about in these situations, HR taking the notes. And just a, a clarity, you know, what's the, the issue around that? So between 5.6 and 8.7, um, so 8.6 and 5.7, uh, there, there seems to be um, a lack of clarity between those two. Maybe I've missed something, but. Yeah, I, I will clarify that because it, it isn't always HR that's no. taken the notes. In fact, yeah. um, for some hearings, it's advantageous to have somebody else, but it's quite difficult to act as an HR advisor and to take notes at the same time. So Agreed. yeah, I'll just tidy yeah, that okay. up. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's also on 695 uh, on page 27, the panel's decision, and we haven't referenced the panel anywhere else in the document. Um, Sorry, which paragraph was that? It's 695, page 27. 6.9.5, it talks uh, okay. about the yes, panel's we, decision and yes, there's no reference elsewhere to a panel. panel. Yeah, so okay. slightly confused with that. Um, and then the only other comment, I note that you don't record um, hearings in any way. Um, I have, I know, I've had a bit of experience in this area. I have to say recordings are particularly valuable mm, at a later definitely. stage if it ever happens uh, because people tend to forget what they said previously and uh, it's been quite useful um, uh, both from both points of view it doesn't uh, necessarily go in favor of the, the employee or the employer but it just absolute clarity of what was said um, so uh, I know from experience we used to record all grievance and all disciplinary procedures uh, so there's absolute clarity of what happened um, and I know you don't do it at all so it, it may be just something to, not necessarily for this particular change but for future to consider and offer people if they want it. Um, you know, if you want it recorded, we can record it for you. It's a, it's optional rather than being mandatory in the yeah. in, in the process. I think even though it's not explicitly mentioned in there, I think as you say, there is scope that if both parties agree to a recording, then you could do it anyway. Yes, that's fine. So th those were only key points that um, that I brought up. Otherwise, I thought it was a, a well written, well well presented, and fairly clear document for uh, employees to understand. Um, so is there any other comments before we move to um, the recommendation? The recommendation is that we approve this document uh, on behalf of the council uh, for it to now become the formal grievance policy, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, do I need a proposal and second there? Just well, I do, please, okay. Proposed by Councillor Hemsley, seconded by Councillor Powell. All those in favour? Sorry. I'm, I'm just slightly concerned. Um, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I thought it should be... Oh, no, sorry, change. I think it's really important. He's not in charge of it anymore. He's sitting over there, I'm supposed to be here. That's why I didn't put it in there. Okay, are we clear? Yeah. Thank you. All in favour? Thank you. Good night, Mr Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. I know where you're coming from, but uh, it's a different situation tonight. Right, and I think we're now on to item nine. Our item eight is the... Uh, item nine, retention of staff. Here's the next item. And again, Miss Nell, if you'd like to present this report. Thank you. Um, this again is, is a follow on report from a previous paper presented, but focuses more on turnover and loss of staff. Um, as, as we've discussed uh, before, um, you know, the past two years has certainly brought forward some different trends and behaviours in recruitment, retention and turnover, and as we were talking before, uh, ways of working. Um, I think we've certainly mentioned before how unpredictable um, the working world uh, has become. Uh, and I think, you know, that combination of different demands and expectations um, of work coupled with working differently is certainly um, a dimension that we've just not seen in this scale um, before. It's certainly not something I've experienced um, in my, my time in HR. 
Um, so we, we can look at some overall data, which I've presented to you um, in, the, in the report, and we can compare it to previous years um, and the local government um, sector. Um, and this might tell us, you know, from a statistical perspective, that um, things aren't too bad and we're not necessarily any worse, better or indifferent to, um, to anybody else. Um, but I think, as I said, you know, when we compare year on year data, we, we start to compare a very bizarre year to perhaps what might have been a typical year um, previously. Um, so there's lots of data and we can do lots of analysis, um, which we do. Um, but I, th I think, you know, when we look behind that um, data, any lever that we have within this organization, you know, leaves, leaves a gap. Um, we, we lose knowledge, we lose skill, we lose experience, organizational knowledge, uh, personality and style. Um, and for small teams, of which most in this organization are small teams, um, the impact on the capacity of that team is, is quite marked and it is, is quite significant. Um, uh, you know, I think also it's inevitable, as I laid out in the report, um, you know, that people will will leave. It, it, it is just, just the way of, of life. And I think, you know, the next six months to a year will be an interesting one to watch in terms of how retention and turnover um, does start to, um, start to shift. Um, I've provided in the paper a little bit more information and analysis of the lever population in terms of who they are, um, where they go and what they go to. Um, and it is important to understand that because it enables us to identify uh, where we do need to focus um, our effort going forward and enable some change. And as Councillor Wallace said earlier on, we can see that um, levers within their first year or two is higher than you certainly would want to uh, want to see. And it's understanding the factors um, behind that. Um, I think you know we, we do need to be pragmatic about what we can do to um, to manage that and manage those um, those risks. So, as you can see, a number of people do leave us for further career development, progression, um, change of career. Um, and we shouldn't challenge ourselves that we can actually resolve all of that. You know, we're not going to keep everybody in this um, organisation. The, the, the size of our teams and our structures don't enable us to provide the sort of career development and pathway and succession planning um, that we might like to see and that perhaps what some other organisations are able to. Um, I've worked for large authorities. I, I've, I've never seen it to date work brilliantly um, well, and I'm sure if somebody cracks it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll buy it from them. Um, so, you know, we will continue to seek um, feedback, hear what people say, um, and work to create a positive working environment that, that does enable people to grow and develop as far as we can take that. I think that's what we, um, we owe to people and to ourselves. Uh, you know, we talked about you know, the workloads and, and pressures. We, you know, we owe it to ourselves to maintain the resources and quality of people that, that we've got. I mean, if we look at our senior management team, you know, they've all been promoted from, from within. Um, none of them on that senior management team started in the job that they are currently in. And we've got that at other levels in the organisation um, as well. The development manager in planning, head of adult social care, head of corporate services, governance manager, um, electoral services manager, head of HR, shall I say. Um, social workers progress through our trainee um, scheme through to through our career grade into qualified social workers and, and onwards. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, we do okay. We're, we're keeping an eye on things. I think as we talked about a very difficult uh, market. So retention, you know, we really should ensure it's the best way of dealing with recruitment actually is not, not let people go in the first place, retain people as best we possibly can. Um, but inevitably some people will go. Um, so I think as we said, we have got a lot of work to do this year. Um, leadership and management development around future ways of working, corporate plans, set of values, different ways of working, you know, lo lots of um, challenges um, to work through. Um, I think quite interesting and challenging um, pieces of work. Um, I think the whole bit about engagement of the workforce that we've already talked about in a different way, something Mark is talking um, at quite openly at senior leadership team. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to see that that level of dialogue and appreciation is increasing within our managers groups. I think some of the concerns you've talked about in terms of uh, that work ethos, um, that team ethos, that organisational buy-in. Um, people are seeing how we've got to find and learn different and new ways of engaging with people in a different way of working in a different model. Um, 
So it's so interesting to get your perspective on things. I appreciate it's a bit, bit data driven, but I think, you know, given us some food for thoughts and things to monitor and keep keep diving into and in a little bit more detail. Councillor Harvey and then Councillor Waller. Thank you. I just um, I, I just had a couple of um, comments, really. I know at 2.2 we said that um, for the first two quarters of 21-22 our turnover was 6%. I didn't know whether um, that was comparable to last year or not. Um, that's kind of half a year. So is that in any way comparable? Should I just double it, so to speak, in some ways would be the expectation. And then my other comment would be, if we got a crystal ball out, it, it would be interesting to compare this or to look back at this in, in, in a couple of years, because um, obviously we had a lot of resignations um, in 2021, but I'm very conscious that was right at the beginning of the pandemic when people's lives radically changed and that well could have meant that everyone reevaluated their lives. And um, so, so that... I, I think it would be interesting to look back at uh, where this kind of goes in a few years time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. you I, I can give you some comparison figures for Q1 and Q2 for 2021. If you can just bear with me. So we are on Q1, Q2, we were 2.4, 2.1. Um, so the equivalent Q1 um, was slightly, ever so slightly lower in, 2021 um, for Q2 um, for this year that's we're, we're showing us 3.2 in Q2 in Q2 for the previous year it was 2.1 so we are seeing as we predicted a little bit of catching up and I would predict also for Q3 probably similar to the previous year but I think Q4 might be slightly higher so I think we are starting to see some catch up of people looking to do something different, move on and change, yeah. Professor Waller. Thank you, thank you very much for that. Um, we have small numbers, which makes the percentages large. Um, and I think we all acknowledge when Councillor Harvey's right, things have been different during the pandemic. People are re-evaluating their lives as well as evaluating whether they want to be home-based, office-based and all those other things. So I think it's going to take a number of years before that settles down one way or another. Um, what I am interested in though, we've touched on it or you touched on it, Mrs. Snell, and that is we seem to be having quite a bit of turnover for people who've only been with us less than two years. But conversely, if you've been with us five years or longer you don't leave um, but what we don't know from this is whether uh, it's the numbers behind that so it could be that you've only got one person who happens to live around the corner and they're never going to leave anyway until they finally retire um, but it, it is interesting and it in when we're doing our staff surveying I wonder if we can find some way of probing that what makes you want to stay with us? So just a thought. Thank you. Councillor Hemsley. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, um, two things I noticed. Uh, the first was that on 3.3, um, one person left to have 100% home working. So maybe there's sort of some, some desire there for people. But the one that interested me was a career development progression opportunity for a change on page 41 was nine. Uh, and destinations is the same, public sector, local government, nine. So it, the people are leaving, nine of them have left for, you know, similar jobs probably or progression. The rest seem to have gone for other reasons, um, either, you know, personal reasons, whatever, but they've gone into other employment. So it, it's a bit difficult to say, well, here's an assessment of what it is, because working in local government, as we know, um, even being, you know, a councillor can be quite um, interesting work, but it can also be quite stressful. So maybe some of the things have created, you know, anomalies in there. Thank you. Yeah, and so I'll just add something on that. I think also, as, as, as I've outlined in Para 3.4, um, I think what is what we need to understand is whether there are other underlying issues 
Um, so these people that have gone on for career development, different direction, you think, well, that, that's, that's great and that's lovely. Um, but maybe there are important messages under that that we also need to know. Well, what prompted you to think that way or to act that way? And, you know, you might get a comment to say, well, actually, there's no point in me staying here because there is nowhere to go. Um, or it may be for other reasons. So I think, I think there's still, you know, data behind that. But the information I've given you there was easy for us to combine. It's, um, it's actually getting underneath some of that, I think, in terms of some more detailed analysis about where you got to and that, that point in thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, thank you. Just, just a quickie, um, and that is when we do the exit interviews, and we need to find a way of doing everybody, even if it's online, um, do we say, do we ask them if they feel valued? Now, I'm not saying we don't value our staff because we do, but that doesn't mean that an individual feels valued. Um, and I think that's actually quite an interesting question, because if we're getting a significant number saying they don't feel it, that's contrary to what our perception of, of our own staff, and therefore is something we need to consider about how we communicate. Yeah, I think you're right. That, those are the sort of questions we ask. So we ask them questions about how you, what you think of Rutland as an employer, your experience here as an employee, how you've been treated, how you've been developed. Um, what you think of us as an employer, would you encourage other people to come and work here, would you come back, um, as well as some specific um, rated information around what you think about terms and conditions, pay and so forth, yeah. Thank you. Tessa Paul. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think, um, sorry, I was, yeah, the exit interviews, first of all, obviously you, you haven't got much data from that and just to I was going to say what Council Waller was going to say. I always find it amazing in organisations I've worked for and with that, you know, somebody joining has to do this, this and the other. Somebody leaving doesn't do an exit interview. And I was pleased to see that you're also going to sort of do some verbal um, follow up, because I wonder if that's a bit of a, a good proactive way of trying to get, as you say, under those, um, und under the actual under the actual figures and get a better sense of what the issues are. I was also going to say, obviously, we do want to retain staff who can develop, but equally, a certain amount of turnover is good because also we don't want, you know, it's not best for the organisation for people to have people in place who are blocking other people's development or who don't move on. So, but look at it overall, it looked like we were fairly comparable to other local authorities and maybe I don't know if you had a view of what what and again it's the percentages skew things what a sort of a healthy rate of churn which side of the the line do, do you think do you think we're on or oh is it because it's of the changes and uncertainty it's perhaps it's a bit difficult to say yeah I, I don't know what a healthy number would be because I think sometimes it depends who goes um that's the thing as you as you say in, in some areas you know some turnover is is quite healthy there are some times in an organization's lifestyle life cycle when that is even more healthy than um than others depending on what's going on in the organization the level of change that's going on um in my own team I've got a small team I've lost two people in the last you know nine months um so my turnover number percentage in my team won't look very good. Um, but, you know, they've, they've gone on to really good things. And I'm you know, really disappointed I've not been able to, to keep them. And the impact is very significant and will be for the next, you know, six months. So, um, yeah, so that, that is a challenge. Um, and I think in terms of the exit interviews, yeah, you're right. I think people that fill them in tend to be those that perhaps have got something not so positive to say. They, they perhaps use it as an opportunity to... Um, to talk about some things they want to let off their, their, their chest. So that's why I think the interviews and doing more of them are more valuable because you get a much a better balanced view. A couple of interviews we've done recently, you know, are, are far more insightful than, than, than a form or something online, to be honest. And, and they've actually really appreciated the opportunity to talk about their experience, you know, some good, some not so good. Um, so certainly the, the verbal interviews do work very well but clearly they you know they are much more time consuming but they are much more enriching in terms of the quality of the information that we get so the investment in there probably pays off much more than otherwise yeah Hemsley 
Thank you. Um, I, one of the things I noticed, obviously, uh, at um, 4.3, it is incumbent on us as a good employer to look after our staff. But I also think that elected members need to probably, you know, consider we need to look after our staff and how we react with them and behave. And I think that can also have a, an impact on them um, because, you know, it's, it's a tough world at the moment. Um, I know we've been through a lot, but we're beginning to come out into a new way of working. And I think it's, it's important for us to show support as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think there's anything else. Um, can I just pick? I'm oh, sorry. No, thank you. Um, really, really just uh, comments, really. I mean, it's very obvious that uh, agenda item seven and agenda item nine going forward are, are very much linked and not a dotted line, very much a, a firm line in my book. Um, what I would say, there's, in my experience, there's no perfect solution, no perfect system to collect and capture the various uh, bits of information. I think you can start to quantify for comfort certain categories of lever, husband promoted, going off, exercise. And I think we can be quite bold in that sort of reason for leaving, um, emigrating to New Zealand or Australia. So I think we can look at the list somewhat. Um, just as a comment, historically, of course, there was a, probably not allowed today, but the chairman of the council used to conduct exit interviews, would you believe, going back uh, a few years, as a someone, as an aside from, uh, from if you like, other members of the management tier or whatever. Um, and that was all recorded. Um, large structures are given a great opportunity, but they can also be very staid and very, um, very slow in giving exposure. Uh, I, I rate small being very good, and I think that's an advantage we ought to try and play more. Um, I, I think you could have, doesn't matter what grouping, but you, you can have a certain uh, individual coming into the business where you can put them into a structured training package where they can do a really good job in a particular department for six months, nine months, and they can go on to get experience. And it may be their level of experience. For example, they would you wouldn't come in as a junior and take SAV's job in six months' time. But you, they're, they're, you can be quite clever, and I have experience of that where you you get a group of people who come into the business you put them on a training management trainee structure if you like and that certainly captures them going forward and you, you know you you can hope then to perhaps have them for five years or so what you what you're experiencing i think is the benefits of working uh, within a small organization with its fast track exposure that they then gives those individuals that that ability, that experience to progress into other uh, jobs that we cannot offer, the greater tiers of pay, et cetera. And I think we have to uh, accept that and be realistic about that. But I think if we are a little bit entrepreneurial in the way we set out our employment package, we can, you know, we can bring some, I don't like the word improvements because that's saying we, we've got a, we've got a, it, 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 there's too many negatives, but I think we, and I think you're indicating that perhaps with uh, uh, Mark Andrews in his yeah, and I, discussions and I think, with senior management. Yeah, and I think you are. I think, you know, we shouldn't um, use the fact that we're a small authority, so therefore our ability to attract, develop and grow people through the system isn't going to happen because we, as we said we've had some really good good examples at a very senior level but we're also seeing it at a junior level um, as well so our trainees that we took on in children's social care what two years ago um, became qualified with us and are now on a trainee contract um, with us and are doing really well in fact I think it'd be great to roll one or two of them out in front of you actually at some point because they've got enormous personalities are really very empowering individuals actually um so so that that's good um you know that they're you know they're learning their trade with us exceptionally well and actually 
of being a very intrinsic part of that service and organization, which is really good to see. In planning, which we know is you know, horrendously awful to recruit into both in um, Justin's team and in Roger's team, we've got trainees in there. In fact, one of them got an exceptionally high acknowledgement on her exams results recently. Um, has done really well uh, and we'll just fly through her career I've got an HR trainee um, in my team um, and again you know seeing her develop and grow and also for me having the opportunity to bring somebody through the you know the HR um, roadmap is 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 really quite pleasing so um, I think we are quite good at it I, I personally would like to see more I've spoken to managers about the national graduate development program that that is still a bit of a struggle I'd have to say but I would still love to do that um, you know, we might still not make it this year, but, you know, we'll give it another shot next year. Um, so I think it's, yes, yeah, it's, it's grabbing those opportunities. Oh, in building surveyors as well. We've got trainee coming through the route there. And again, that came from internal. Um, somebody who actually used to work as a parking services officer moved into our building um, surveying team and is actually um, now trainee building surveyor. Um, and we'll be qualified hopefully in the next two or three years. So I think, you know, we you know, grab those opportunities as and when we can and seek further ones as well is really important, yeah. I can come back on that, Chairman, but exactly that, that was exactly what you've outlined is exactly the sort of vision I've had in business where you would take someone on in a sales role and, and selling is selling, but I would then say, well, what's your O-level French like? Because I would like to now fast track your, your French to go on to our sales desk. And what desk, and what's your, what's your German like? And, and, and you suddenly build, and if you do that, you see suddenly those people have acquired the skills that they have, latent skills or skills that have been left at the age of 16 or 18, and you can take those forward. And then of course you build into uh, where you can, nip across the channel and meet our French customers in Santa Maria or whatever. And that brings in a, no, but it brings in a variety to the color of the employment here within Rutland. And it's, a, and you've got the plus point of it, it's a good place to live anyway. But I think it's just a question of thinking a little out of the box yeah, well, I think, and I think, trying to define yeah. I individuals. Think I think Ms. Snell's uh, indicated that. And Absolutely. The, the examples yeah. that are very good. And I'm, I'm not too sure we need, need too many French or German speakers um, <laughs> in Rutland. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm sure there are other people who can speak French and German better than I can. Um, so can I just sum up then um, what we've discussed this evening? The key points, I think, for me are um, we like what's happening in the exit interviews and the work that's happening there, uh, but I think there's a, a need for better understanding for the, those more subtle reasons for leaving, and I think the interviews that you're now carrying, uh, I think there's a general support for that, and I think it's a, an excellent move forward in the exit interviews. Um, I think there's uh, concern, obviously, that any small change uh, has a big in impact um, within each of the departments and then the organization. Uh, just one comment on our turnover. Um, we have had a lot of interims turnover this last uh, two years. I mean, just to look at the um, head of highways as an example, I mean, what are we on to now, fourth? Um, oh, no, it's permanent now, I'm sorry, I missed that. Um, so I think, you know, there are, uh, we have had a lot of interims sort of circulating through the organization and that will impact the one year uh, and, and two-year positions. Um, finally, I think all the other comment I'd like to make, or question I'd like to ask, and that's, I'm just wondering whether our one-to-ones are actually delivering um, the information that's really needed about people's real views about their career with us, um, what the issues are, where they want to go, um, how they might want to develop, um, because those clearly are the areas where you can pick that up and you know help people not to leave by recognizing some of their concerns, weaknesses, wherever it might be, um, and keep them within the organization. So that, that, that one to one area, um, certainly from again, from my experience, is, is critical. Um, and the skills required to do it well um, are quite difficult. And it goes back to this issue of culture. If we're, we're starting to move to change the culture, to improve the culture of working in a remote way or a more remote way. Uh, then I think that one-to-one -one, uh, debate discussion uh, is absolutely critical um, because you're not seeing people on a day-to-day, week-by-week basis and pick up the, the, the vibe, vibes from them on that. 
So those are, the, I think, the key points that we've picked up this evening. Uh, but we note the report, and I think it's something um, the committee will want to keep an eye on, uh, particularly with this short-term blip. Is it a short-term blip or is it a more serious blip? Because I think there are concerns. We've seen some some very good people go this last sort of six to eight weeks. Um, there's been some excellent people who have who, who've moved on. I was about to finish that point, but I shall allow you one short comment. Thank you. It's it's uh, because of what you were saying, Chairman, um, oh, yeah. picking up on that. No, no, I, I support it. Um, I, I, it. And the change in our performance management system, what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, at various points in my public service career, when performance management arrangements have been changed, I've been subject to training or offered training, encouraged to take training. And in one case, took two lots of training, one as a manager and the other as somebody who was managed and what to expect from the process. And I think that's actually even more important now with so many of these um, interviews, these performance management for want of a better expression sessions that both the employee and the manager knows what to get how to get out of the session what it is they want and need um, so i think there's actually it's important to get the training right as well thank you okay Sorry, moving on to item number 10, uh, National Pay Award. Thank you, Chair, or um, lack of National Pay Award as it's becoming um, known. Um, so as, as we know, in April 2020, we received a pay award of 2.75%. Um, negotiations for the 21 award um, still hasn't reached agreements. Uh, the union starting point was 10% um, plus other measures and as we knew then that was always going to be unaffordable. Uh, where we ended at the end of 2021 was the national employers had submitted a final offer of 1.75% um, and the three unis, unions, Unison, Unite and GMB advised that they would proceed to ballot in consideration of, of strike action. Um, the outcome of that process of balloting was that Unison only achieved a turnout of 14.5%, 14.5% turnout um, of membership, and therefore they fell short of the minimum of 50% turnout in order to um, have any industrial action that would be um, lawful, so, so that, that was a non-starter. Um, GMB um, didn't actually proceed to a formal strike ballot and Unite, uh, we're still awaiting the outcome of their ballot. That was quite a late one um, issued. Um, so the current position is that there will be a further round of regional briefings by the end of March. Um, I attend those briefings as the head of HR and Councillor Waller attends um, as our member representative. Um, in the past, they have been joint meetings. So um, I'm assuming um, that will be the case. Um, so, in, in, in summary, from the 21, there, there is still no, no pay award and no inkling of any timescales as to when that might happen or what that might be. But what national employers are raising with us is the knock on impact in terms of the 22 pay award, because normally we would hope to be at the stage where that's agreed and we would be um, moving to implement it. Um, so. You know, there's also some other emerging pressures. Um, the national living wage has increased to £9.50 on April 1st this year. Um, so we have to implement that. We've actually only got one employee on pay point two. Um, so we have to uplift those. Um, but what that does, it reduces the headroom in terms of the next pay point three. Um, again, for us, that's not a significant issue. But for um, authorities um, and for schools, that, for example, have roles where, you know, midday meal supervisors and um, employees within the, the kitchen staff, um, their pay points are very close to each other. And it just erodes that differential between what is otherwise a supervisor role as opposed to non-supervisor. So it, it, is a, it is an issue for, for many employers. Um, ending of the public sector pay freeze. Um, now, whilst that uh, doesn't apply directly to local government pay, it has been a factor that has been um, reflected in previous years um, consultations. 
Um, inflation is now rising and we're likely to either see a further rise or it will stabilize around five to six percent. Um, national insurance contributions go up in April 22. Um, I could go on, obviously. Um, you know, capacity pressures, as we've already um, talked about, whether that relates to just not enough people in the market um, to, to undertake jobs, for example, social workers, um, or whether it's a specialist role um, where the candidate market, um, you know, might normally be broader than, than the public um, sector, you know, as we've said, you know, recruitment and retention is difficult. So capacity on us as a workforce is pretty high. Um, and as with other employers, you know, we are seeing less applicants um, um, for a, a vast range of roles compared to what we might have done normally. Um, in terms of other pay negotiating bodies, um, the JNC, the Joint um, Negotiating Committee for Chief Executives, have actually this week approved a pay award of 1.5%. Um, but the Joint Negotiating Committee for Chief Officers is, is still um, unknown. We are keeping staff informed. We briefed them a couple of weeks ago at the all-staff briefing. We shared our disappointment still and, and frustration um, that this is where we're at. Uh, and we updated our leadership team again last um, week. Um, as you know, our pay policy has to go to council by the end of March. So we've scheduled that um, in and will reflect any further updates and the current position um, in that paper at that point in um, time. So that's scheduled for the 21st of March. I don't know when the regional briefing is going to be. Um, we may have some more information by that meeting. It may be quite late, um, in which case it might be a verbal briefing um, on the evening rather than something we can put in the report given the timescales for submission. Um, so, so that's where we currently stand. Just a reminder, when it is agreed, it does get backdated to the 1st of April 21. Um, but clear just means employees can't have it in their pockets at this point in time still. Councillor Harvey. Sorry, it, it, it's a bit of a silly question and you probably will all know the answer, but I, it's just regarding the national insurance because um, obviously we know it's going up in April and there'll be additional employer contributions as well going on to that. When it's backdated, Will that will we still have the um, because obviously it will be paid in that period? Will there be the additional national insurance on it and the employees kind of going through because that will be a year's wage uplift on everybody? It's going to be quite a sizable amount in employees and things. And so I wasn't clear whether it was a silly question or not. No, it's not a silly question. I mean, obviously, the new rates apply for first of April 22. So um, what should have when when we eventually get an award and say we get a backdated payment in May 22, that will be an uplift on our salary for the period April 21 to March 21. So my national insurance contributions should be based on my salary and the rate of the national insurance at the time. That's what should happen, in my understanding. It would be a huge challenge for payroll providers and pension providers. Um, but I think what you're indicating is, is whether the new national insurance rate would apply across that total amount. I think it might be worth checking that out yeah. because certainly from my experience, both on NI and on tax, income tax, it is the year in which you earn it. It's when right, okay. it's deducted and the earning comes when it's paid in through PAYE. Now, the, there was a question, should we be... Um, having a local agreement with our staff that says we will pay the the two point or the one point seven five percent that you're due in this current year, and if anything else comes next year um, by by negotiation, then we'll pay it in next year uh, above that figure. Um, just a thought, you know, to think about because that would save uh, the staff, in my view, certainly half a percent on their uh, on their uh, salaries at this point in time. Yeah, I think because we're part of the national agreement, we can't act independently outside of that national agreement without coming away from national pay bargaining, which that would require idea. change to everybody's contracts and agreement of the trade unions. Um, and although we're small, it doesn't mean to say they won't take us on for way, moving away from national pay bargaining. And we'd need an alternative measure in place for... Um, and interestingly, those authorities that did move away from national pay bargaining actually did start to morph back or what they do they use the outcome of the national pay bargaining award to mirror their own award um, anyway so there's very few that operate above and beyond 
Um, and I used to work for the, one of those authorities that did, but even that's eroded um, now compared to those. It's maybe worth days just when picking that up. But I will check that out because, should, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, that's a good point. Thank you for that. My concern um, moving forward is that uh, the best indications are we'll see inflation at 7.5% plus by April, May time. And uh, my worry is that uh, the impact of utility costs coming through on top of that afterwards is going to have another impact on inflation in the short term. So I think uh, we're in for a, a rough ride in this next 12 months. Um, and who knows what happens after that. So thank you for that. Um, very useful. And we look forward to hearing what uh, information comes out in March. Um, item 11 is the work plan. Um, the work plan has been issued. We've got... Uh, for our next meeting, um, which will be in the new um, year, uh, the new uh, fiscal year, um, we've got future ways of working, which is a standing item, and apprenticeship strategy, which I think is uh, two key areas. Are there any items for future that we want to add? Um, looking around the table, I don't see any. Um, the, the only thing I would maybe look to look at for the start of the new uh, year would be uh, all the employment policies and just where they stand in terms of um, review time. When's the last time they're reviewed? When they're due to be reviewed? Do they have a review date on them? Uh, just to say, yeah, uh, that's fine. They're not desperate. We don't have to look at those, but this hasn't got a review date on it or it hasn't been reviewed for some time. And then we should just have a quick look at it just to make sure we're, we're happy with it. Um, I, you know, I know in, in parish councils, we review every one of our policies every year. Um, it's only a, a once over and a quick glance, but uh, they're all looked at to make sure they're, they're valid and up to date. And thank you. I think we also, at the next meeting, need an update on the pay situation. Yeah, absolutely, that'd be very useful. So we're looking at um, pay on the, uh, the next meeting. In there. The gender pay gap will come back at some point. It depends when the next meeting is as to um, the preparedness for that. Can I just make comment in terms of the policies, just in response of what you, you, you raised um, there. Um, with our we tend to re review them as and when they need reviewing. We moved away from a fairly rigid review timescale because nine times out of 10, they really didn't need any work doing terms. So actually the process itself created a process of work that um, was not necessarily um, productive, but I think from members of the uh, committee, it would be interesting to know how many policies yeah, we have. That's fine. Yeah, I can do. We can do something. I'm not looking for something very that. complicated, yeah, but just to make sure that you know we we understand what's there yeah, and fine. what's yeah. liable to come up in the yeah. 12, 18 months, two years, and maybe some indication in terms from yourself about um, um, employment legislation if a potential change is coming forward, so that uh, members can be uh, aware. Uh, and keep their eye open for, for that coming through and read the, the documentation accordingly. Okay, um, you've also put in the flexible working policy, which obviously will come through and the, the whole future way of working and the umbrella leave policy, which I didn't know umbrella's got leave, but then that's another story. Okay, thank you. I think that's all that. Um, just one item on urgent business, um, just for members, information an appointments panel has been created for the monitoring officer and i think a number of members are on that um councillor hemsley um councillor um Payne, councillor waller councillor oxley and uh, councillor powell councillor powell thank Probably you councillor oxley thank you sorry in place of councillor yes and then councillor dale and councillor dale sorry i thought i knew it was one of those Okay, thank you. So um, that is uh, due in March. March, thank you. Okay, if that's uh, come to the end of the agenda, the end of the meeting, thank you very much for your attendance and thank you for your uh, indulgence with me as chair. So we close the meeting at 8.28. Thank you.